Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley with another post Collab Talk Tweet Jam interview here, and we're talking with uh, Sharon. Hello. Hello. How are you? So we were talking today about understanding the impacts of Windows 365. Before we get into that, of course, why don't you introduce yourself, who you are, where you are, what you do. Hi, my name is Sharon Weaver. I am from Lenexa, Kansas, which is actually a suburb of Kansas City. Um, and I own a company called Smarter Consulting. We're a Microsoft partner and I'm a Microsoft regional director and an MCT. So I play in all, three, all things M365. We just spent the last 20 minutes kind of going through talking about other business and technical things. <laughs> just, we can't connect without kind of going through like our checklist of this is what's upsetting us today or <laughs> hey, this is going on or what do you think about Microsoft's new release? But speaking of new releases, I mean, so this is a, was an interesting one. You know, Collab Talk was built around, you know, all things collaboration technology. Going slightly outside of the boundaries of just the collaboration, we're talking about Windows 365 in that release. Microsoft has been talking about this for a long time. Long time. You know, and, and so to actually see this kind of move forward, so I'm, I'd love to get your thoughts around this. So let's kick things off with, your input on question number one. So, uh, am I in the right one? Yes. How is hybrid work changing the fundamental role of technology at work? Yeah, I mean, I think when you think about how people felt, and I, I hate we we hate to admit how much COVID has really provided so much digital transformation in our space, but you can honestly kind of look at the before times and the after times. Um, and the interesting part is that in the before times, um, before COVID, um, you know, if you said to your boss, I'd really like to work remotely because I'm going to be at XYZ and I can still get my job done, but I'm just gonna do it on my computer and I'm gonna stick around there an extra day and I'll be fine. Well, I don't know. I feel like you need to be in the office. I don't know if you can be at that place and still get your job done productively. And then COVID hits and everybody goes home and works remotely right after this. And I feel like having it in the real world has really made people understand how productive and how happy and how successful we can be as a remote workforce. And so I think that that's, you know, it, it says a lot in terms of having that ability for transportability in terms of software and cloud usage. Yeah, it, it's, I think it's a great point. It's like, it, it, we forced, well, we, in nature, the world, it, we, we were all forced into digital transformation, not just an upgrade of the technology, but it's forced organizations to really take a hard look at what do we actually have, where are the gaps, and what needs to be done, how do we get better at working this way, and whether or not companies think that they're going to go fully back in the office. And I, I think that there will always be a component or you know, a hybrid scenario for the majority of, of organizations. Something like this could happen again. I mean, it would just is that's where we are in the world at this point, this stage in, in history. But to now have a, a, a more realistic conversation about digital transformation, um, not just about, hey, let's get on the latest version of the platform, but really look into how can we better support our people? What are we missing? What are the tools that, that are missing here? Right. Well, and it was really interesting, you know, I, I would say from a, a cloud software perspective, right? Because what we're talking about is that idea of a cloud software that we can access kind of anywhere, anytime. And it's so interesting when you think about people with digital transformation, and then there was companies that were literally making their employees pack up their desktop PCs mm -hmm. and take them home and then be on a VPN network to be able to access file shares and network drives and things like this, right? Um, versus those who had already deployed Office 365 who were like, go home and get on whatever device you have available and we'll make sure you have what you need. But I could get home immediately if we're in that situation and I can hop on my personal laptop or you know my my phone or something like that and I can immediately be productive and working. So it's the you can see the disparity in the kind of old hardware model having everything you know right there locally versus moving to this kind of cloud um, approach. We've already started to kind of answer the next question, so let's jump <laughs> in and expand upon it. So in your opinion, what are the benefits of a Windows 365 cloud PC? 
Yeah, I mean, the benefits are absolutely portability. Um, you know, so so many times you're tied, and I can tell you, I mean, for, for years and years and years, the only application that I really have to keep is my quick my Quicken and my QuickBooks, right? Those are downloadable yeah. applications. And for years, as the cloud has come in, I've got new laptops and new surfaces and new devices that I can pop on and access anything anytime, except for my Quicken, right? And so I understand this disparity, but I think the idea of a portable system where no matter where you're at, no matter what device you're on, you can simply log into whatever, you know, whatever you have available to you. If that's a library PC, if you're at your mom's house, if you're, you know, on the road and you just need to get on your phone real quick, like no matter where you're at, if you have a device that you can get on and access everything in one place, it just changes the game. Right. You, you know how Microsoft has for a few years now talked about uh, in the future, being able to support uh, moving like Android apps uh, onto you know Windows devices and leveraging those there. Um, you, you know this. Uh, you know, of course, VMs, virtual machines are not you know new, uh, and so but to have all of that and be able to you know move across and use it on a Linux or a Mac or you know where, wherever you are, be able to to dial in, pull down that entire experience, not just the application that you're working on, not just the Microsoft 365 stack in logging in via browser, but having the full experience um, via Azure. And so you have all of your favorites, all the organization, it is your desktop, it moves with you. But it also means that an organization that is deploying, especially to people that are geographically dispersed, how much easier it is to build out and support and track what those people do, what they have access to, build out that the old brick model of setting up a laptop. Now it's just basic install, make sure it has securely accesses the internet and then log in to, to this, this version of yeah. Windows. Exactly. Yeah, that's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, what are your concerns? Question number three, what are your concerns about moving to a Windows 365 model? So what are the business impacts, if any? I mean, you know, the more that we approach cloud, so, you know, we see this in our personal lives as well, is like streaming is fantastic, right? I love having streaming services. I don't have to, I don't have to buy DVDs anymore. I don't have to carry DVDs around. I don't have to have a DVD player. I mean, think about all of the things that that has changed in our world. But what happens when I want to watch a movie and I'm in a location that doesn't have great connectivity? Right. You're going to face the same problems. And I think our I think of all of it, the biggest issue that we're going to face is connectivity. And as bandwidth is more and more and more required for everybody, especially in a household. Um, I mean, mine's no exception. I have um, three males in my house that game and stream constantly. My husband works from home as well. You can imagine the demands on our, you know, our uh, network that comes in. Um, and I think that's it has been a little atypical over the years because we're more techie than most people but i think as the average person starts to get more and more and more cloud-based those connectivity needs are going to go up and up and up and up and if you're not in a location that has great connectivity um or you're unable to get to it i mean i right now can just log into my computer and if i'm not connected to wi-fi it's no big deal for some of my things but if my whole desktop requires me to be connected that becomes a problem really fast yeah i brought up the comment during the the tweet jam you probably remember about the licensing issue as well i mean especially in the short term and i know it's it's a very low cost for for that service but for organizations that will like do they need to go and buy that and duplicate the other licenses that they have for their on-prem and hybrid their current stack uh, and so it could actually the organizations in, in incur yet another cost on top of what they're already paying until they adjust, until they figure out, you know, what do we actually need for the majority of our users? But it, it also means that there's a tremendous opportunity for MSPs. So I think that the, the partner, and I know that we've got a question later going through specifically the partner impacts. But that is, it becomes easier for partners to go in and provide, you know, their own flavor of Windows 365 with their other solutions, kind of pre-programmed for their for their customers, 
And so again, it gets it's easier to go in and to deploy that. It also means that, well, I'll, I'll talk about that, the partner impact during that question. Um, but that's something, those those licensing costs that we we don't yet know what that really will look at once it looks like once it settles. And I made the comment of, you know, even if it's a low cost for that, there should be some uh, even lower cost for those organizations that have both. So for a licensed user has both of those in place. Yeah. Um, so there there we'll we'll figure what, out what that de- needs to be going forward. So yeah. Um, Question four, what are the security data, data sovereignty and content lifecycle implications of moving to Windows 365? I know that could be asked in three separate questions, um, but I was just I was trying to put that down as a category. Yeah, I mean, I I think theoretically this should actually be easier. The problems themselves don't change, right? We still have security issues. We still have um, privacy issues. We still have compliance issues, right? There's things we still have to deal with. I don't think those change. Those areas do not change at all. What does change is because we have more control over the software and the deployment of the software and the configuration of the software. And at a moment's notice, we can have a kill switch, right? And so, the difference, I believe, is that we're still going to have the same problems, but I believe that it will give IT infrastructure and operations more control and IT security more control over those choices. So theoretically, it should make it easier. Right. Well, it's interesting. I know that um, I know this is a slightly different topic, but like I, I have, so I use personal devices. The bring your own device BYOD, you know, movement has been big for a long time, and that's also been a huge risk. It's been, uh, a, you know, a security risk. It's been others for, you know, for for organizations. And and so while organizations, if it's an organization owned device, they can have control over that. I as a user, I can elect to give my company control over my device. I don't. I don't elect that. Um, but I, I take certain, you know, uh, protections, I have certain steps for, for protections uh, in place on my personal devices uh, so that I am I am meeting the standards that my organization has no matter where data sits. So I make sure that I follow those protocols. Be right. I, I think this could give organizations more control in that BYOD, you know, in, environment have more flexibility but again have more control over hey here are the assets it's a it's a virtual machine so if you're going to do work related activities you spin that up if it's your device your laptop your whatever it is uh and then i can toggle over and use just my machine and and uh be free of those controls in my own environment so um I, it's just another option there for organizations to give flexibility to their their end users yeah absolutely well and you know even for those companies that are um I, i'm gonna say this in a nice way have more restrictive needs whether that's by choice or by some sort of regulatory <laughs> requirement um it also gives them the ability to do that because i mean that's been one of the big heartaches um for a long time for it is you know when when you've got a company that's like we don't want our users to be able to have this 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 do this do this and sometimes it is regulatory and sometimes it's just the culture of the company but i think it gives them so much more control to dictate like you said what that work environment looks like versus what my personal environment looks like and it becomes more obvious which one i'm working in Right. So question number five, how will Windows 365 impact partner products and services? I mean, you know, we were just talking about this before, but I I really feel like it's going to open the door um, for more opportunities for partners and services. Um, If you think of kind of the old days where there was a lot of uh, companies that were really successful because they were hosting, right? So they would host SharePoint or they would host applications that maybe were too expensive um, for small companies to be able to afford or um, or they would host entire um, setups because maybe a company didn't have the right IT staff to be able to to manage that or they just didn't want the headache of it. Um, And I think that has spun down drastically over the last 10 years. I mean, a lot of the places that I know that we're doing application hosting um, have all but kind of given up the ghost on a lot of those types of services. And I think this is one of those areas where all of the sudden 
now you can play in that space again. You can be part of that happening. You can help to configure. You can help to customize. You can help to train. You can, you know, you can be part of that solutioning in a way that we've not been able to do for a while. And there are, of course, uh, you know, there's a huge push around uh, solutions built across the the verticals, the industries that Microsoft is focusing most of their core. They're dead. for the new fiscal year, FY22. Of course, as people know, Microsoft's fiscal year begins July 1st. Uh, they've they've kind of reduced the number of industries that they're focused on. Not they're not they're not doing things for these other industries, but the lion's share of their focus is around those six. Uh, and they're incentivizing partners to go out and develop solutions for those things. We also see that they're pushing heavily partners to put those solutions in uh, App Source, in the Azure Marketplace, and other global marketplaces so that it becomes more um, transactable, you know, the solutions that are there. So as I was talking about, yep. we mentioned earlier, partners can go and piece together their solutions. MSP, CSPs can put together like the partner solutions that they want to include for their customer base and then go out and market that way and provide customized services around those solutions and that, that expertise. I always use the example of like a, an MSP that focuses on, on like project management, knows that industry, knows that space, knows what customers are looking for, can provide the entire you know, Windows and Microsoft 365 stack, partner with AvPoint add-on governance, policies and insights, a bunch of different apps or things. And then a company, one of our partners, you know, your company could go in and develop a solution specifically for healthcare or specifically for manufacturing or for the gov, you know, sector education. Uh, and, you know, utilize, pull data out of AvPoint solutions and out of Microsoft and all those things, bundle that up together and we all win in that scenario and it becomes easier for you to go and deploy that and as you make changes and improvements to that to automatically provide those updates. So it it, it streamlines so much of, of the experience and allows those customers where you have a lot of those creative types that like their Macs you know, the best, let me just say that <laughs> I like one of the best Windows experiences I ever had was on my wife's Mac with Vista. When Vista rolled out, it ran beautifully, never had problems for years on the Mac hardware. Yep. And so, you know, <laughs> run, more run similar through, to the Mac OS. Yeah. So, but anyway, you can, you can, uh, you know, deploy that out wherever your your employees are and you don't now have to think about as much about what type of device that they're on let them go do their creative activities on that side but then still have all the benefits of of windows and the microsoft stack no i i definitely think that microsoft is basically giving partners kind of a leg up um, because if you think about it this is something that i've been spending a lot of time really learning about is the whole idea of productizing services and productizing knowledge and productizing solutions so i can be a one-off and i can go help individual clients with a specific service or a specific solution but if i can productize that and then i can provide it out to the masses it's a win-win for both of us right um my earning potential goes up and I'm now offering that solution to a broader audience that can get more value from my knowledge that's going out there. And I think by by having this opportunity, Microsoft is now saying to their partners, hey, we know, we know that this is a win-win for you and the community. So let's, pre let's create that bridge and let's help you get there so that we can provide this value back out and we can share that knowledge out. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, you know, I, I think it was Satya in, in a keynote like five, six years ago, you know, said that, hey, every for part speaking to partners, like every partner is a software company, like every consulting company is uh, is a software company and people kind of scratch their head and and work fully realizing, you know, catching the vision of what what that actually meant, what they could go and do. But it's exactly the way that, that you summarize that, that service partners can go and productize i use that phrase all the time you know, productize um their services the things that are unique about their offerings and bundle that together with the collection of the other solutions partner solutions like AppPoint with with microsoft and build that package that's going to best meet the needs of their you know their unique needs of their customers yeah i i see it as a win as a partner win as well 
Uh, question six, uh, where are the greatest integration gaps between Microsoft's collaboration and productivity solutions? Awesome. And I always like to throw in that that collaboration productivity. Again, we are collab talk here. I'm talking about collaboration. I, I like the meme that you shared. <laughs> I'm surprised you don't have it up because you you put post that question and it immediately came into my mind. And it's the moment where the genie on Aladdin is like the exits are here <laughs> because <laughs> honestly yeah. everywhere <laughs> because from an architecture perspective. Okay, so that's where my brain thinks. My brain is it lives in architecture mode most of the time. And when you think about the app fabric as a whole and you think about the graph and you think about all the applications and you think about all the productivity and how everything kind of weaves into each other i believe we've made progress for sure um it's so nice to go into certain products and be able to start to interact with other products um i believe that brings a lot of value but i mean opportunities uh everywhere like every application has an opportunity to more seamlessly integrate with the other applications i really feel like teams if you know if they were running a race like teams would definitely be like at the front of the race um and i think that teams is really kind of a champion in that space and they're like check it out we can touch everything right now all of it's not necessarily smooth but i think they're definitely going a long ways to be able to pull that productivity suite into one place and work with everything i think the people that are at the back of the pack are definitely uh, microsoft search i understand microsoft search is younger and a little bit newer um and and honestly has more touch points in a different way and has more you know some more technical stuff behind it once again i feel like it's getting there but i think it's got a long ways to go um before it really integrates properly um and i think the big laggard unfortunately in a lot of this is outlook um outlook is a staple application for as much as you want to say you know oh ditch your outlook and go to teams i use both every day very regularly um i've been speaking on outlook for years i've been speaking about outlook integration for years and outlook and sharepoint have some of the best integrations some of the most seamless integration that i've ever used with outlook and i feel like a lot of that was taken away um, when the cloud solutions came in, I feel like a lot of the, the those points of integration were kind of, you know, severed and and now all of a sudden, you know, we're like, well, let's tie it back together. And a lot of that is getting remade now. Don't take me wrong. I really do like some of the stuff that's come in. But if you're asking me where are the opportunities, definitely search, definitely Outlook um, and frankly, SharePoint as well. Um, SharePoint is so much better than so many people give it credit for and i feel like it kind of stands alone um out there and it does all these crazy things but then somehow you're like well i've got my internet i've got my team sites i've got all my content in here now can i interact with this other thing inside of here uh no <laughs> so i mean i think there's definitely room for improvement there as well well, let's jump in. I know that we, we've uh, we've gone a little long here, but uh, question seven, the final question: What is the future of the cloud PC? So, what are your predictions for the next five to ten years? This is so funny because I wrote a blog like five or ten years ago um, about the future of work, <laughs> and yeah. I very much envisioned the idea of you know anytime, anywhere, location independence, um, and how I could essentially take my slim client or my yeah, or thin client or you know something very very small and then log in to my pc at home and be able to access all of that information and just kind of go wherever i want i still think that's a thing um i think that what's the future that i see um especially being able to have all of these cloud apps available and having a cloud solution like that is that i can take a very small device anywhere i need to go and access things fairly quickly and easily. I'm probably, now I'm a technologist, so not everybody's gonna be like this, but as a technologist, I like having my extra monitors. I like having my space. I like having my power. I like having my connectivity. So at home, I still have a beefier setup um, for a lot of those reasons. But I think the idea of being able to truly work anywhere, anytime, full location independence. If I'm at my mom's house and I, I need to do something real quick, I can just log into my full setup right there. If I'm at the library, if I'm on a trip and I didn't bring anything with me because I'm on vacation, so who needs to work on vacation? But there's an emergency, it's a SharePoint emergency and I need to log in and I need to do my stuff, right? Um, it's very, very easy for me to do this now in the future. You know, 
uh, so a few, quite a few years back, uh, well, I mean, it was, so six, seven years ago, was at an event in London, and we were at kind of the speaker's dinner at some pub in, in central London somewhere, and MVP Michael Knoll that you know well, um, we were all, as a group of us, going down to an event in South Africa after this event in England, and he mentioned, and he's a you know hardcore traveler, mentioned that he had a new device, and it was a beefy smartphone for back then, you know, uh, pre- pretty hefty, but had everything, his work, all of his presentations, uh, all within, uh, you know, on his phone. And so we talked about, he had the little connectors for it and everything to be able to go and do it. So he did that entire trip, did presentations at two major conferences and made edits while he was traveling on the plane to his presentation there on his device, did all of that, you know, a few years back. Think about how much easier that is. So you're doing light things where you create it and say, look, I'm trying to travel light. All I need to do is be able to present this in a mode, have your, you know, have your smartphone ready to go with that device and, you know, and, and kind of, you know, share it from that or broadcast from that. Or, you know, I, even easier than that could be that you make edits on it uh, and, and it's automatically, once you're synced onto Wi-Fi, back up into the cloud so any edits on the airplane and that you go up to that you know dumb terminal at the or the event whatever laptop that they have as long as there's an internet connection pull it down have the full experience for everything that you need that are part of your desktop um if the connectivity is good if the the broadband as well which infamously doing a large event in a conference center in johannesburg you cannot count on the quality of the the connectivity but he had it on his device to be able to give it if that was was the case. Well, and if you think about it from the um, from the IT side, from you know from the IT um, department side, managing those accounts as well, like we talked about earlier, there's no more need to make custom desktop setups for all of your employees. You can spin them up an environment the way you like it, um, and typically it's going to be, hey, I'm going to copy the environment that I like for my template, tweak it to this particular role or that particular person, send them their login information, and you're done. So you have that seamless login Windows experience Mm -hmm. and that same, and yet that same crappy multi-tenant experience. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, if we can get that Uh, all figured out, it'll make uh, my life a million times better. I mean, the, the, I would joke about this, about how like Teams for multi-tenant on the mobile device is awesome. It's yeah. easy. Like, and I've just thought about like having like so a, simu- a simulator on the desktop for the mobile experience and just having the app up there all the time and use Teams there. But yes, I agree. Anyway, I know. Maybe Microsoft someday, someone will step up to the plate and fix that issue. I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just just do it, Microsoft. Why do you not want to fix that? I... <laughs> uh, well, Sharon Weaver, thank you so much for your time today uh, and for participating in the Tweet Jam. Folks that want to find you online, how do they do that? Uh, Twitter, Sharon E. Weaver, or you can go to www.smarter-consulting.com. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for your time.